Welcome to the R video tutorial on random number generation, part two. This is part of Statistics 321 at Virginia Commonwealth University, but anybody can use it. Okay, from last time we learned how to deal with the normal distribution and the uniform distribution. So let's just quickly review those. So normal, when we would ra uh, randomly generate from it would be R norm. And here we'd put number of samples. Here we would put the mean that we were interested in and the standard deviation. For the uniform, we would use R unif, and we'd put the number of samples, and the lower bound and upper bound of what we were looking for. And we also talked about setting a seed for reproducibility. So uh, you might want to try that and see what happens uh, if you haven't looked at the previous video yet. Okay, so there's many, 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 many more distributions that you can sample from. So uh, one common one is the chi-square distribution that many of you have heard of before because you may have done a chi-square test for co um, contingency tables. All right, so the chi-squared is R chi square, and you saw the tip, uh, tool tip pop up. Uh, you can say how many you want to pull from it. Let's say I want to pull a thousand and I only need the degrees of freedom for this It only has one parameter. So what happens if I put the degrees of freedom of five? Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is I'm trying to show you that you can Learn about a probability distribution that you may not want to or have the skills to be able to understand it from a mathematical perspective of doing all the calculus, but you can still learn about this distribution based off of these random samples. So, for example, here is our chi squared 5. I can run this, I can get a histogram of it. And let's see what color do we want to make this? Why don't we make it green for no other reason than it? I used light blue last time. All right, so make the X label equal to X and make main equal to chi square. Okay, so let's see what this looks like. When you run this, you get this picture here. Notice that uh, chi square distribution is always a positive number. Uh, and notice it's not stacked up like the exponential was that we looked at before. It actually starts at zero, comes up, comes back down. Now, we would like to know some properties of the chi-square distribution, but the integration and stuff can be a little bit messy if you do the calculus. But you can learn about it just by looking at the samples. So here I'm going to take the mean of this thing and just see what the mean is. And... Notice it's really, really, really close to five. And notice that our degrees of freedom are five. So that might actually lead you to believe that the degrees of freedom and the mean of the distribution are the same. And if you work out the math, uh, sure enough, they are. So, and that's, that's great. Uh, what we want to do is look at some other distributions because those are actually harder to get a hold of directly. So like there's the gamma distribution, which is related to a gamma function for those of you who are mathematically inclined and have played around with gamma functions. Here we're going to do our gamma. Let's pull 12,000 of these things. And this has two parameters, alpha and beta. So here uh, I'm going to put in like 10 and then here I'll put in, let's see, 0 0.3 or f how about 5? Okay, and then I can run this. I'll look at a histogram of it. And in order to look at a histogram of it, I'm just going to copy and paste our previous one just to save some time. And you can tell that I have fat fingers again today because I can't seem to type. And I'll change a few things here. And I'm going to put gamma 10, 0.5. And I want to learn about this as well. So I'm going to do the mean of GAM1. And we'll see if we can't figure some things out about it. All right, so let's run this thing. Notice that the gamma, again, is similar to the chi-square. And if you play around with the math enough, you'll actually see that the chi-squared is a gamma distribution, just not this one. Uh, so here I've got, it starts at zero. Oh, they're always positive numbers. They get, and notice it has a nice sort of skewed right shape. 
Um, but we got to figure out where this thing's centered, and that's going to be the uh, big trick here, is what is the mean? And so let's give this a try. So if I look at the mean, it's 20. Now let's see, how does 20 relate to this? Um, well, maybe that's not obvious yet. For those, those of you who know about the gamma distribution, it is obvious. What happens if I make this 1? What happens now? And let's see what the mean is and see if what happens. Notice that this shifted dramatically up to 100. Okay? So when we made, just by changing one number, it made it go from 0.5 all the way up to, uh, I mean, the mean of 20 to a mean of 100. And all we did was change this. And if you notice, this is 5 off, right? Five. This is 5 times the other one. And notice we changed the number by that amount. So if we looked here, you can actually figure out that alpha and beta, or the mean here, is equal to alpha. If I can type it, eh, still not typing well, uh, divided by beta. And if you do the mathematics, that's exactly what happens. So I'm going to change this here real quick. We want to put in some comments on what we need to put into these here. So here you would do R chi squa number of samples and then the degrees of freedom here we've got the gamma distribution and it is our gamma and here you put in the number of samples that you want however many you want and then there's an alpha parameter and a beta parameter Okay, and so we can actually keep going with this and look at one of our other favorite distributions, which is the T distribution, also known as student's T distribution. And here it's just RT. So we can use RT. We need to know the degrees of freedom and the number of samples, and we can start pulling things out of here. So let's try this out. Uh, let's put a comment first. RT, put in here number of samples and the degrees of freedom associated with it. So let's make this T1, uh, and this be RT. Let's say I want 15,000 with a degrees of freedom of 5. And if I do this, I can also, again, get a histogram. I can look at it and see here T1. And let me put in here, this is T with df equals 5. Let's see what this does. And notice we get this picture here. We get a distribution that is centered at 0, and it's spread out uh, a reasonable amount here. So it goes from maybe minus 8 up to maybe 11. So it has a good spread on it. It's symmetric. It's centered at 0. It doesn't really have any unusual features. So we can keep playing with this more and more and more if we want to and see what actually happens to this distribution. So we can go to 1 and 1, and this here is an interesting distribution. Uh, it's the T with 1 degrees of freedom, but look at the scale on this crazy thing. It's super, 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 super wide. And that's, that's kind of interesting uh, because the T distribution uh, has, with one degrees of freedom, has really fat tails. If you go to two degrees of freedom, we can see what it looks like. Uh, and again, it's not looking much better. Three degrees of freedom. See what it looks like. And four degrees of freedom. See what it looks like. We started off with five, and it seemed to behave. Now it's starting to behave a little bit. The scale is coming back down. And let's see here. Let's go to five degrees of freedom, which was where we were before. Starting to get it in more usual shape. Let's see what happens. See what happens if we go to like fifty. If we go to fifty here, we get something that looks quite similar to a normal distribution. Uh, it's not actually a normal distribution but it looks quite similar. 
And one of the things about this is if you played around with the T distribution long enough, you know, the bigger the degrees of freedom get, the closer this distribution looks to a normal distribution. Uh, and you can prove that mathematically as well. But we're going to skip that at the moment. It'll uh, converge to a standard normal distribution. If you want to really get crazy, look at it with like a thousand degrees of freedom here. And... You can look at it, and that looks like a normal distribution uh, for all intents and purposes. And you could overlay one if you wanted to, but we're not going to do that at this time. All right, so we've seen these distributions. Uh, there's a couple other distributions that we're going to talk about that we need to talk about here, which is the binomial distribution. Uh, which is here it's got two parameters but we're going to do our binome and the interesting thing about the binomial distribution is it's a discrete distribution it only turns out whole numbers okay these other ones turn out decimal uh, numbers uh, this will only turn out whole numbers so here we've got a parameter n and a P, uh, value p which is the probability of success so this is the number of successes uh, in a trial of n samples so we're going to do a, an experiment n time and p is the number or is the probability of success so we can actually do this so just do bind one r binome and let's see let's see if i wanted a thousand samples from something that had uh, 5 and 0.5 okay and then we can get a histogram as well but the histogram might look a little bit off uh, just because this is a discrete distribution but you sh should be able to see this pretty easily all right so let's see what this thing looks like and notice it's a little wonky here there's gaps in here which there absolutely should be uh, and the reason there should be is it's a discrete distribution. There are no values between 0 and 1. There's either 0 or there's 1. Or there's 2 or there's 3 or there's 4 or there's 5. 5 is the most you can get, most successes you can get if you do an experiment 5 times. And you can actually look at the data if you want to right here. So you can go bind 1 and you can see they're all integer values. They're all whole numbers here uh, that this thing generates. So that's uh, interesting as well, and it's quite useful uh, to have around. There's one other one we want to look at real quick, which is the Poisson distribution. And this is our Poiss. And then here you put the number of samples again. And here you have a rate. Uh, and I'll just put here, usually it's lambda, but I'll just put rate. And this is the rate of... So a Poisson experiment is basically you're counting the number of arrivals or the number of events that occur in a specified amount of time. Okay, so let's do Poisson 1, and we'll say our Poisson, I want 10,000 of them, and let's say 5. On average, in any time interval, 5 show up, uh, or we have 5 arrivals. When I run this, you'll notice... Uh, if I look at the actual data, the, again, it, it ran out of space to put all of these, but they're all whole numbers. However, there's no technical maximum to these numbers. So keep that in mind. In the binomial, you, if you're going to do five experiments, you can't have more than five ex or five successes. All right, so let's do this one real quick. And we'll use this in our next video to build a more complicated type experiment uh, where you can really see the power of uh, this idea here of random number generation to understand the system All right so if i do this we look at a picture zoom in notice that it's the number of arrivals it has to be a positive number this thing is skewed to the right it's on average there's about five but it could be a lot more maybe it looks like this one goes up to 16 or nobody could have showed up so these are all within our pro uh, possibilities, and this is a nice distribution to be able to work with. All right, so we've looked at several more probability distributions and sampling from them, and we've also learned how to learn about these distributions by using uh, sample quantities from them. All right, so it's time to move on to the next video.